Welcome to the second part of the second lecture where I will cover RDF schema. In the previous lecture we've seen that RDF is a data model even though it provides us constructs to declare the type of things. Um, it allows us to declare properties, to create containers and lists. RDF, however, is not expressive as an ontology language. In order to better and more accurately describe the world, we need to avail of ontology languages that allow us to infer implicit information from explicit information. The one that we will be covering in this lecture is RDF Schema, a very simple ontology language stored as RDF that allows us to create role and type hierarchies. RDF Schema is a W3C recommendation, so it's a standard. It is built as an extension of RDF and it provides us ways to describe role and type hierarchies. It allows us to describe resources, things, in terms of classes, properties, and the values of properties. Let's dive into the deep end of the pool with a simple example. Here we have an RDF turtle document in which I have declared three namespaces. First one, for my example, the RDF namespace that I won't be using in this example, and the RDFS namespace that you can see here. In this RDF turtle document, I have three statements. The first one states that this thing, animal, is a class. This will represent all the things that are animals. The second statement is this thing, horse, also being a class. We will be using that to represent all the things that are horses. And then the third statement states that horse is a subclass of animals. So all things that are horses are also animals. Visually, you can depict this as follows. And here we see that horse is a subclass of animal and both horse and animal are instances of RDF S class. Remember that A is a shorthand provided by RDF turtle for RDF type. Now let's introduce two instances to our RDF document. First, I declare tornado being an instance of a horse. Tornado is Zorro's horse. Then I introduce Garfield as an instance of animal. We all know that Garfield is a cat, but I have not declared cat as a subclass of animal in this particular example. Graphically, this is as follows. We have Garfield being an instance of animal and Tornado being an instance of horse. We've seen in the previous example that RDFS provides us with a type, RDFS class. The RDFS W3C recommendation provides us with a couple of types that we can use to create our vocabularies. The most important ones are shown in this table. Let's start with RDFS resource. RDFS resource is the top element. All other classes in RDFS are derived from it, and everything is an instance of a resource as well. Everything in RDFS is a resource. RDFS class, the which, which we already used in prior slides, is to represent all classes. It's the base class of all classes. All classes we introduce in RDFS vocabularies are instances of RDFS class. Similarly, there's a base class for properties, but instead of proposing a new label or a new tag, they reuse RDF property. And you notice the namespace um, RDF over there. All properties in RDFS vocabularies are instances of RDF property. RDFS has also introduced RDFS literal as the base class for all literal values ranging from strings, integers, to dates, and whatnot, all things you can print on a screen. It also introduces RDFS data type, the base class of data types, ranging from XSD int, XSD string, to XSD date time, and even data types from other um, 
ontologies such as GeoSparkle's WKT literal. Then there's a special data type, XML literal from RDF, which is used to hold XML data. We won't be covering that in these lectures. RDFS is described in terms of itself. So in this little diagram, you can see that all the classes are related in two ways. There's the subclass of relationship, the same one we've seen in the example uh, before. And for instance, XML literal is a subclass of literal and literal itself is a subclass of resource. Now, because RDFS is described in terms of itself, all these square boxes, sorry, rectangles, are classes. Hence, they are declared as being RDF type or an instance of these classes. So RDFS resource is an instance of RDFS class. And similarly, RDF XML literal is also an instance of RDFS class. RDFS also provides us a set of properties. We've already seen one RDFS subclass of. All RDFS properties can roughly be categorized into three categories. One to create our type and role hierarchies. One describing characteristics of our properties. And then three to, for us humans, meant for human consumption. As seen in our example, RDF subclass of is used to create a type hierarchy. It allows us to create a class hierarchy go, ranging from more abstract, well, going from more abstract to more specific. Similarly, for properties, we can avail of sub property of to create a hierarchy of properties. We can state that love is a sub property of knows because if you love somebody, then you probably or should know that person as well. RDFS domain and range allows us to tell us something or state something about properties. Domain is used to say what the type of um, resource is when it plays that role. So if you state that having a name has the domain person, whenever something plays the role of having a name, then that thing is of the type person. Similarly, for a range, it allows us to say something about the type of the object of an RDF triple. If having a name has as a range XSD string, then whenever you encounter, encounter a literal being played on by that role, then it's supposed to be an XSD string. The three other properties are meant for human consumption. RDFS labor, label is to provide labels to things that we can consume and comments can be used for descriptions, definitions, paragraphs, and whatnot. Then there's a special one, RDFS defined by, allowing us to point to human readable definition of a class. This is usually a URL, but can also be a bibliographic reference that you uh, store inside the RDF document. Here's a more elaborate example where I will be demonstrating some of the classes and properties we've seen in prior slides. First, before I continue, do notice that I use relative URIs, but I haven't declared a base URI. That means that all of these URIs will be resolved against the location of my RDF turtle document. I introduce a couple of classes in this RDF document. I have a person, a teacher, and a course. A person has been given two labels, an English label person and a, the same label, but without the language tag. This is often known as a default label. I also provided a comment stating that this thing represents the class person. Teacher is a subclass of person. So everything that is a teacher is also an instance of person. The third class is course. Then I declare a property, has teacher. This property is an instance of RDF property and has been provided to common the relation between courses and teachers. 
And you can see that I declared the domain of has teacher to be course and the range to be has uh, to be teacher. Important to note is that um, for us humans, the labels I've used make sense. I, as a user and a human, can interpret those labels. Now, this is not necessary for a computer-based agent that knows how to process RDF. For a computer-based agent, it's more important to have distinct URIs for teacher, person, course, and has teacher. And that creates an interesting tension field. For computers, it's not important that the strings inside URIs make sense, but it may be handy for us humans and developers to engage when, uh, with those when they provide you an indication of what they contain or are. We have stored this RDFS vocabulary as a RDF turtle file. And in this RDF turtle file, we currently have 10 statements. You can count them. Now, what will happen if I were to add a 11th statement, which is as follows. We have iOS has teacher Christoph. Because this is an RDF document, it now contains 11 statements and an agent that knows RDF is able to only discover those 11 statements. So if I were to ask an RDF enabled agent, what are the types of iOS and Kristoff, it is unable to find them because there are no explicit statements about their types in this RDF document. If I were to ask an RDFS enabled agent, however, an RDFS enabled agent is able to reason over the rules captured in this vocabulary to infer implicit information from the explicit information. What can we derive from this document? A lot of things. The important bits for this example are that iOS is an instance of course because iOS is the subject of a statement with the predicate has teacher. It will also infer that Christoph is an instance of teacher because Christoph is the object of a triple with the predicate has teacher and the range uh, refers to teachers. Because teacher is a subclass of person, it will also infer that Christoph is an instance of person. And those are three triples we can already derive or infer from our RDFS document. Now, there are a lot more. Remember, RDFS is um, described in terms of itself and everything is a resource. So an RDFS reasoner will also infer that everything is an RDFS resource. Not only are things, but also everything that we have declared in our document. And the list continues. Can a class be the subclass of multiple uh, classes? And the answer is yes, and it's pretty straightforward. Here we see that A is a subclass of both B and C, which means when that whenever we have an instance of A, that instance is also an instance of B and an instance of C. And that's easy enough. A little bit more tricky is when we deal with multiple domain and multiple range declarations for a property. You can find the explanation from the W3C recommendation here, but I will just illustrate it with a simple example. Here we have a property name that has two domain declarations, one being a person and another a cat, and that property name has only one range declaration. 
You might be wondering why I didn't um, declare name to be a, an instance of RDF type. Well, it's inferred. I use RDF as domain, and the domain of RDF as domain is RDF uh, property. Now, let's continue. I'm now using that property name to state that this thing has the name Christoph. Now, what is going to happen with RDFS reasoning? Well, we know that that thing has um, plays the role of having a name and that the domain of name is person and cat. So that means that that thing is an instance of cat and an instance of person. And hopefully you can see why this is not, uh, this might not be desirable uh, and how this can be an easy enough mistake to make. Uh, the result is Christoph is both an instance of a cat and a person. While you might want to express that only cat, oh, if you have a name then you're either a cat or a dog. So how can you solve this in RDFS? Well one way is to use um, uh, type hierarchies. So we would declare a class for person or cat and you would then declare person to be a subclass and cat to be a subclass of person or cat. Um, I will use no um, namespace prefix here just for this example. And then you would change the domain into person or cat. Now, hopefully you can see that um, this is quite convoluted and not really uh, scalable, especially when you have multiple declarations. So one way of um, solving this could be to think in more abstract terms. So rather than having person or cat, you might state, well, I have a thing and things can be named um, no matter what they are and then you just declare the uh, domain of name to be thing. What I wanted to show here is some of the more fancier uh, possibilities, such as stating that a name belongs to either a person or a cat, or uh, stating things uh, such as a person can only have human babies and an elephant can only have elephant babies, localized constraints are difficult and at times impossible to do with RDFS. And we already stumbled upon one of its limitations. It's really good for type and role hierarchies, but not really good for um, expressing more um, elaborate constraints when it turns to the when it comes to the universe of discourse. And this will be the subject of one of the next lectures on web ontology uh, language. We will now go through a small exercise where we will implement a conceptual schema into RDFS. You can see here a conceptual schema in the object role modeling diagramming notation. Uh, ORM diagrams are more expressive than entity relationship diagrams, and we will use those to illustrate some of the limitations of RDF. I will now go over all the concepts and relations in this uh, conceptual schema. Let's start from the concept person, which we have here. A person has a person name, and they are related uh, with this particular relation that has two roles. The role with relating people to person names and the role of relating person names to people. A person is born in a city and a city is the birthplace of a person. Again, that is a relation with two roles, born in and birthplace of, where one role is the inverse of the other. <clears throat> 
Like people, cities can have a name. Uh, cities are connected with their city name with the role with and city names are connected with their cities with the role of. We have introduced a, a specialized person, um, a subclass, deceased person, and you can see that deceased person is a subclass of person with the arrow. And finally, there's a relation between deceased people and cities uh, here where uh, Deceased person, a deceased person died in a city, and the city is the death place of a deceased person. And again, those two roles are the inverse of one another. Same here for the lexicons. Um, the only uh, thing that I still have to explain is all concepts denoted by an ellipse with a full line are things that cannot be printed on a screen. They're called um, uh, object types, OTs. Um, below we have ellipses that uh, have a dash. Those are thing, things that can be printed on a screen and they are called lexical object types. Uh, this will be important later on because these will constitute um, properties whose range will be RDFS literal. So let's start with um, person and city and their lexical attributes. Now, first you might notice that these roles are the same. Uh, so one of the questions that we have to ask is, even though that the, the labels of these roles are the same, the roles are different. The role of a person having a name is different than the role of a city having a name. So while when we need to implement, implement this into RDFS, we should ask ourselves, shall we declare them as different properties or as the same property with appropriate domains and ranges? And remember that can be um, quite complex in RDFS. For this example, we will go with the former and reserve the latter as an exercise. Before we continue, however, we have to remember that in RDF, the uh, subject of a, of a, of a triple is a thing and either they have a uh, either it is a resource with an identifier so a named thing or a blank node the object of a triple can be a thing or a value and this is quite important because that means we cannot have properties going from lexical things to things therefore we cannot model these roles that is impossible with the RDF data model. And that is one of the limitations. We cannot have properties going from um, strings or literals to things. It's only from uh, things to things or things to literals. Here's the start of our RDF turtle document um, where we will store the implementation of our RDFS vocabulary. You will notice that I have declared a, a namespace for my uh, vocabulary, um, example.org people.rdf. I have included the namespaces of RDF and RDFS. And something new is the inclusion of the prefix for the web ontology language, which we will need later on to tackle a particular problem. Um, the implementation of the class person is straightforward. We introduce a uh, URI for person and state that it's an instance of class and we provided a label. For person names, uh, we need to adopt a strategy. Um, we can, we need to choose a label or a URI for, with label I meant computer label, a URI for uh, that property. I have chosen to go with person name. I could have also chosen with person name, with name, but had I chosen with, then I might have had a problem with the other role that I have to implement later on. So bear that in mind. So I went with person name and I declared it to be an instance of RDF property. The domain is person, the range is literal, and the label is person name. The implementation of city is uh, similar. Uh, one can 
basically copy paste the statements of the previous slide and replace occurrences of person uh, by city. So we have a class city, give it a label city, we have a property city name, the domain is city, the range is literal, and we provided a adequate label being city name. Now we will um, implement a relationship between person and city. And this is where we will find or um, be faced with one of the limitations of RDFS. Now we're going to implement the relation between person and city. So in that relation, we have two roles, which will result in two properties. The first one was born in, um, going from people to cities. And the second one was birthplace of, going from cities to people. And that seems to be pretty straightforward, but something's wrong with that. The problem here is we have declared two properties that are not related at all, but in our conceptual schema, both were the inverse of one another. So that's not correct. So how do we need to solve this? Well, first, let's look at the problem. We know that in our conceptual schema, born in and birthplace were part of the same relation and they were the inverse of one another. But that's not possible in RDFS. Um, if we were to go with this approach, then one cannot infer that if Christoph was born in Ghent, then Ghent is the birthplace of Christoph. That's not possible. Moreover, if I were to state in an RDF document that Christoph was born in Ghent and Ghent is the birthplace of Christoph, they're considered separate statements. There is no relationship between the two predicates. In order to solve this problem, we need to avail of a, another ontology language. The web ontology language provides us with a predicate called inverse of that allows us to state that a property is the inverse of another property. Here we see that birthplace of is the inverse of born in. Also, notice that I did not explicitly declare the domain and range of birthplace of. This can be inferred via this predicate. If a property is the inverse of another property, then the domains and ranges are switched. All inverse of is part of the web ontology language, but commonly used and accepted when creating RDFS documents. And uh, you will sometimes see that extension between quotes of RDFS be called RDFS++, but that is in no way a standardized convention. Now let's implement the uh, relationship between deceased people and people being the subclass relationship. That is quite easy. Sorry, that is quite easy. Um, we just declared deceased person being a subclass of person and we provided an adequate label. Last thing we need to implement is the relation between deceased person and city. We now know how uh, to avail of all inverse of to do so. So here we have the two uh, roles or the two properties uh, that represent the roles of our conceptual schema. We have died in and death place of. And we declare that the death place of is the inverse of died in. And that's the end of our RDF uh, S document. And we have implemented our vocabulary. Now we will um, create a couple of instances um, using our newly created RDFS vocabulary and in our example we will be creating an instance of a person that is deceased hence this relation but they're actually the same that person has the name Louis that person was born in a city called Cine and Louis died in another city called Brussels This is the RDF document representing an approach to implement these instances. In our first approach, we will give um, Louis a label 
in our example namespace and do notice that I have declared the namespace of our vocabulary here and I, pre I gave it the namespace, namespace prefix uh, ONT which stands for ontology. So Louis is an instance of deceased person. Now an in instance of deceased person is also an instance of person but we will need RDFS reasoning for that. Louis is born in Cine, died in Brussels, and he has the person name Louis. Cine and Brussels are uh, described here. Both are instances of a uh, city and both have been given their respective city names. If we were to visualize this graphically, this would be the resulting RDF graph um, as a diagram. Now, what I have omitted here is the um, RDF type relationships. Um, they will be described on the next slide. So here's the RDF as a graph from the previous slide and the RDF type relationships we've declared in our document are Louis being of the type deceased person, Cine being of the type city and Brussels being of the type city. Now remember, in our RDF document, we only declared three RDF type uh, statements. And, but we know that in our ontology, the vocabulary deceased person is a subclass of person and every instance of a deceased person is therefore an instance of a person. In order to do that, however, we need to avail of RDFS reasoning. So if we configure an agent to um, conduct RDFS reasoning and we provide it with, uh, with that agent with the vocabulary and this RDF document, then the reasoner will see that deceased person is a subclass of person and therefore can infer that Louis is also of the type person. In this second document, RDF document, we will capture the same information but slightly differently. The first is I will declare Louis as being an instance of both ontology person and ontology deceased person. Now this is still the same. The difference is for an RDF agent, some, so a computer-based agent that knows how to process RDF but does not necessarily avail of or use RDF as reasoning, that agent is now able to retrieve type information about Louis. He can, or that agent can query the graph and ask for give me all RDF type relationships and it will be provided with two statements. That was not the case in the previous slide. There you needed to avail of RDFS reasoning and vocabulary in order to derive both. What is different, however, is that I now declare the birthplace and the death place as blank notes. I do not give URIs or provide URIs for them. Blank notes in RDF turtle denoted by square brackets have as an intuitive meaning that you know they exist, you just don't have an identifier for them. So here I declare Louis to be born in a city with the city name Cine, but I don't know what the end identifier of that city is. Similarly, uh, Louis is uh, died in a city with the name of Brussels, but I don't have provided, uh, I, do, I didn't provide or don't have a identifier for Brussels. This can be convenient when you know something about resources, but you don't have an identifier yet. You know that somebody's mother's name is X, but you don't know who that person is. You just know their first name. In that case, you can declare the existence of a resource with a particular name, but not refer to it with an identifier. Now, whenever you declare blank notes, uh, you cannot make assumptions on how they will look like in computer-based agents. So in my example, I just gave random blank note identifiers, but that's really up to the implementation. 
So here is our RDF graph and instead of three RDF type relations we have four. The first three being the same ones as the previous example and the fourth one being Louis being of the type person. As a final example, I wanted to uh, give you another RDF turtle document in which I wanted to illustrate uh, the same thing, but Louis is also a blank node. I know Louis is a person and a deceased person at that, but I, don't, I didn't provide a URI for Louis. And the rest is the same. So that means I have three blank nodes and a computer-based agent will generate three internal blank node identifiers for them. Um, graphically, nothing changes. There are still four RDF type uh, relationships declared in this RDF graph. Before I continue, one last uh, thing on blank nodes. It's important to note uh, the scope of self-declared blank node identifiers. So for instance, uh, from the previous lecture, we know that within an RDF document, we can declare blank node identifiers ourselves so that we can reuse blank nodes in various statements. So here we have our first RDF document and you will notice that I have reused a blank node identifier to state two different things about this thing. So this thing that is anonymous has the label hello and also the label wor uh, world. Now uh, we know that these identifiers refer to the same thing inside that document. If we were to have another document, however, and in there we have the same self-declared blank note identifier, then we cannot consider them referring to the same thing. This is not allowed. So it's important to note that self-declared blank note identifiers within the same document refer to the same thing, but if you encounter the same self-declared blank note identifier in different documents, then they do not. Here are some well-known RDFS vocabularies that you might encounter uh, or reuse. There's the Dublin Core, um, useful for describing documents in terms of their creator, title, uh, creation dates, spatial and temporal coverage and whatnot. Friend of a Friend is a popular ontology for describing relationships between people and describing people. The Simple Knowledge Organization System or SCAS is useful for describing thesauri, so you can declare uh, concepts and their relations such as hyponym, hypernym, antonym and whatnot. And then you also have shock, semantically interlinked online communities, which um, are, uh, is useful for describing uh, fora and posts, um, the communication between people on, uh, on the web. Finally, this concludes this, uh, the second part of the second lecture and um, here are a couple of references to some of the W3C recommendations mentioned in this slide deck.